The text for the sermon this day is taken from Revelation chapter 21, which you heard a little bit ago. Grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Right here I have a book that's called The Pastoral Care Companion. Most pastors should have one. And in it you have, there's all different sorts of resources for making hospital visits, uh, commuting shut-ins, and things like that. And one of the services that is in here is a service that is known as the Commendation of the Dying. It's a service that is reserved, as you can suspect, for the last days of someone's life. Now, no, it's not quite, it's not really last rites, but it's got similarities in terms of the time of life it's done. And it doesn't always get to happen because sometimes somebody dies very suddenly. Sometimes there are there's uncertainty as to when they will die, and so if you say, hey, I'd like to do the commendation of dying, sometimes people get freaky about it, but we shouldn't because it's a wonderful service. Believe it or not, it's actually okay to have the commendation of the dying done for you more than once. I've actually known of people that they've done the commendation of the dying because they thought they are going to die in the, next, in the next day, and they lasted another six months. And so the pastor did it again six months later, and that's perfectly okay. So, but the other, th and the other reason sometimes is simply that um, there, you need to have somebody that's alert in the room in order to do the service. But I bring it up because there's a whole, during the service, there's a whole sequence of scripture readings that are read. First, there's John 10, my sheep hear my voice. Then you have Psalm, Psalm 31, which said, is into your hand I commit my spirit. Quite appropriate, because those are the same words Jesus said from the cross. Then you have Matthew 11. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Very, very appropriate text when somebody's in those last days, because they are at the most weary a person it ever will be. And it's those words of Jesus saying, I'm going to give you rest. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. And this is where it starts to give pr more purpose. So why do you have rest? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. So what does that mean that he gave his only Son? The next thing you get is the reading through of the crucifixion from the Gospel of Matthew. And you hear how much Christ loves you. What it means that God sent his son into the world meant that he was sent to be crucified. And then you hear John 20. This is the same account that we hear every single Easter. The account of the resurrection. That Jesus conquered death. He rose from the dead. And indeed, hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Check if you're alert. <laughs> and so indeed he's risen. And so therefore, so shall we rise on the last day. But then it comes to Revelation 7. This is the text that was actually the epistle reading from last week. And I'm going to read through, walk through this a little bit and connect it to that Revelation 21 that we just heard a little bit ago. It says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. So a fun little thing. If you ever, in a couple weeks here, we'll be celebrating Pentecost. And on Pentecost... All of the people, all the believers who were in, is, in Jerusalem at the time suddenly found themselves speaking all sorts of languages or being familiar with them. Well, that was kind of a taste of what God has in store. Because on the last day, you're going to be in heaven, you're going to be with all the company, and you'll be able to say, You'll be, somebody will come up to you and they're going to be speaking French. And you speak English. 
guess what? You're going to understand every word they just said. And guess what? You'll be able to speak English back to them, and they will know exactly what you said. You won't even have to take Rosetta Stone or whatever fancy computer app. You will know every language there is. You'll understand every language. That is, it's going to be the perfect reversal of the Tower of Babel. So, they're standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes. What am I wearing right now? White robe. What are you wearing? A white robe. There's a reason. So everything that the pastor is wearing, there's a point. So the black underneath, the black clerical, it's to symbolize that I am a dirty, rotten, no good sinner who deserves to die. That's what that black means. So if you ever think a see a pastor walking around in this, it does not mean that he's better than everyone else. It means that he's just as bad as everyone else. That's what it means. The, clear, the collar, the white, right at the throat, is to symbolize that when I say, take, eat, this is the body of Jesus, take, drink, this is the blood of Jesus, you could take it to the bank, that that is what it is. When we, you hear, heard a little bit ago, your sins are forgiven, again, you could take that to the bank, because we are ultimately the instrument through which God speaks. That's why it's right at the throat. But right over the black is this, white robe. You, when you're confirmed, you receive a white robe. You have a white robe. When, in the early church, when you were baptized, the way they did it, this is actually the early origin of deaconesses. And the job of the deacon, so when you got baptized, you got baptized in your birthday suit. So, in other words, it was not very appropriate for the pastor or the priest to baptize a naked woman. And so the person that would do that would be the deaconess. The pastor would stand behind the wall and say the words as the deaconess would pour the water. And as soon as they were done, they would put the white robe on them, symbolizing that in baptism you have received this white robe robe. You are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And so I say that because notice these people in Revelation 7, they're wearing what? White robes. So in other words, this and that, it's a preview of coming attractions. One day you're going to be wearing, actually you've already received the white robe, but one day you'll be truly and actually wearing it. So clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever Amen. Those should sound familiar because we sing it in This is the Feast. There's, I don't know if you realize that there are two songs that we sing that there's a reason we sing it regularly. This, the words of This is the Feast, not the whole thing, but portions of it. And also the song feast, Holy, Holy, Holy. The reason why we sing it is because you're going to be singing it in heaven, so we're getting those words down. I mean, if you don't believe me, it's, they're singing it in Isaiah, they're singing it in Revelation. That's literally thousands of years apart, and they're still singing the same song. So, we may not have the same tunes, but the same words. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So the question is, when does this great tribulation come? You know, is this some future event that we're awaiting? Well, the clue is right there in the text. It's in the details. Coming. That's not a past tense verb. It's not a 
It's not a future tense. It's present tense. In other words, when you, it is an ongoing reality. So what is the great tribulation? Life is the great tribulation. Every life is the great tribulation. To give you an example of this, I mean, for one, easy way is just turn on the news. I mean, unless, unless you're paying attention to the Twins who are having a decent, pretty decent season this year, the news is kind of rough to watch. But just take example of last week. Last Sunday was Mother's Day. And Mother's Day is a wonderful celebration to remember and give thanks for our mothers. And give thanks for the work that God has done for us in them. But for many, Mother's Day is a very difficult day. For some, it might be the, simply the fact that they've lost their mother in the last, in recent times. Or they've lost their mother at any point. That This year was my first year of that. Wanting to call and say, Happy Mother's Day, you can't do it. Or those who are estranged from their mothers. They have bad relationships with them. Or mothers who, even though they made the right decision, they gave up their child for adoption. Mothers who aborted their children, even though, and they feel remorse for it. Mothers, women, I should say, Women who very, very much, more than anything, would like to have a child, but it just won't happen. It is a day that brings grief for many. There are many, and this is, by the way, one of the reasons why we, are, we always tread lightly on Mother's Day, and by the way, Father's Day, too, as to how we do it as a church, because we don't want to bring that sorrow. Celebrate mothers, but not in a way that people want to avoid church. And I do know women who will not go to church on Mother's Day because they know it's going to remind them over and over of their sorrow. That is part of the tribulation of this life. We are surrounded by tribulations. This as I think, as I'm going through the commendation of the dying, and by the way, part of that you also, you do read the Psalm 23. And you think about all the people, and you know, Pastor Salcedo brought up last week, all the people that have gone through this, that we've gone through this church. So I've, this year, I will be 10 years removed from seminary. So I'm getting old. I should be, I'll be yelling at people on the porch this, later this month. So I don't know if I'm getting that old or not. But in 10 years, actually, and so I've actually, so I kind of had a weird um, seminary because I had, I didn't become a pastor until a year later because my education was kind of weird the way it went. But in nine years of ministry, I have been a part of over 100 funerals. In Ocheedon, I had 40, and we averaged about 40 attendants at each of those three churches. So when one of the, your funeral numbers is equal to the average attendance, that's a lot of funerals. And you can't help but think of all the faces that you miss. All those faces, you, you remember them. Because, you know, we're good Lutherans. We have our pew. And so you notice that pew, they're not there. Or they'd always be there waiting, sitting on the bench right before church. Or we can even think of an organist that was here when I first just passed away in the last year. So many faces that we miss. And such a reminder of the tribulation we live in. There's one quote I always remember from a TV show. And it doesn't really matter. The line just works. It was the last words she gave to her sister 
when she was about to die, and she said, the, the hardest thing in the hardest thing in life, the hardest thing about life is to live it. Wouldn't that be pretty accurate? Now that this isn't to say there's no joys and glories and blessings in life. There most certainly is. God gives us so many wonderful things. But there is so much sorrow and grief. This is why it says that these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. This is the tribulation of life that was brought upon by sin. It is the ultimate reminder of how broken our world is and how desperately we need a Savior. And see, our God it screams to us in our sufferings. He's demanding our attention to remind you this world is not the end. Don't get comfortable with it. Believe it or not, it's not it's the devil who wants you comfortable. Kind of think of the think of the frog as you put it in the water and you slowly turn it to a boil. That's what the devil wants you to do. He doesn't want you to notice that something is wrong. Because if you don't notice, he can let you cook and you not notice. But God wants you. He wants your attention because those are the, in that text in Revelation, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. In other words, those, the reason why this is read at the commendation of the dying is because the person on that bed, we are telling them that in a, when God comes to take them, this will be their next reality. They will exchange whatever they're dressed in at that moment. Maybe it's a hospital gown for that robe and white. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat or crazy kaboom wind or whatever it was this last week or, or freezing cold ice storms, snow, blizzards, whatever. None of it anymore. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That right there, when you read that text, that's not a future reality. It's a present reality. Everyone who has ever died in the faith Everyone who's ever died in Christ is part of that host arrayed in white. Which, by the way, that's that, that hymn that we a lot of times sing at All Saints Day. Behold the host arrayed in white. We're remembering them. But here's the thing. That's not the end. This is one of the things that pastors... Theologians across denominations are trying to redirect a route that somehow we found ourselves on. That we think that that is the end. It's not. Revelation 21. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And by the way, the sea in Greek literature... In Hebrew literature and ancient cultures, the sea represented chaos. So in other words, the tribulation was no more. This, and what is the new heaven and the new earth? Is this like, swap it out? No. It's actually more like ultimate home makeover. This earth and these heavens, the skies, will be made new. Renewed, made the way they are supposed to be. And guess what? So will you. See, your final destination is that this body, your body, your flesh and blood and bones and all of it will be fully restored, fully resurrected. This is why Jesus says you will receive rest. When you die as a Christian, 
Yes, from a medical standpoint, we say you die. But theologically, death is just a slumber. It's a nap. You're just taking a rest. And you're going to rest in the resting place. Cemetery means resting place. And you'll rest in there. And one day, Jesus is going to walk through there and say to every single one of them, wake up. Wake up. And your, your body will rise. Strong, mighty, better than it has ever been before. And you think, and to get an idea of this, I always think there's a cool imagery to think of, especially when you have somebody that dies of older age, and you have like grandkids and say to them, you know how you've probably seen them in, with a walker or a cane most of your life? When you, the next time you see them, they won't need it. They will be so be much better, so much stronger, that they will be able to do backflips if they really want to. I don't know about you, I've never been able to do backflips, so that's pretty impressive. <laughs> that is the promise. The new heavens and the new earth, because as it says here in verse 6, Jesus says, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. When he calls himself the Alpha and the Omega, this is a confession that he is God. He's the Alpha because he is the source of all creation. He is the Omega because he is the one to whom creation goes. The Alpha and the Omega, and he says, it is done. What did he say from the cross? It is finished. And note, the person who's writing Revelation is the same one who recorded those words in the Gospel of John. It is finished. Because it is finished on the cross, because it is done on the cross by the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the Lamb, the Good Shepherd, Jesus, who is the Christ, because he has done that, because he has risen from the grave, so shall you. Because remember, what was the very first words in the accommodation of the dying? The very first scripture is, my sheep hear my voice, because the day will come. Because you who have been called, those who have confessed his name, last day, he who rose from the dead, the resurrected king, you'll hear his voice. You'll hear, you'll obey, you'll listen, and you'll rise to eternal life. Till that day comes, to him be all glory. Amen. The grace, peace, and mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ Keep you the one true faith to life everlasting. Amen.